Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Greg Talks. I'm your host, Greg. And today we have a special guest with us today. She has worked on films such as Tarzan and a Goofy movie. She has written two books, one of which is called Fish Out of Water. And she is also she is also very much an aficionado for storytelling. Everybody, please welcome Miss Carol Holiday. Hello, everyone. Hi, Greg. How are you? Good. How are you doing today? I am doing super well. I am so pleased to be here on your show. Thank you for including me. No problem. Uh, so just to start off, uh, could you please tell us a bit about yourself and you know, how you got to work with Disney and furthermore, how you got to be so well respected in the animation industry? Well, um, first of all, okay, before I talk about myself, I want to talk about your little Roxanne there in the corner. I appreciate okay. that you drew her. That's very kind of you. <laughs> Aw, that's very sweet. I, I didn't want to, I didn't want to like ignore that there. So thank you for, 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 for memorializing her, tri 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 tributizing her. So of course, you. I have to. I love her character. Yeah. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Thanks. So, um, okay, wait, wait, what was the question again? <laughs> <laughs> so the question is, I wanted uh, just to hear about like your journey as far as like your formative years, how you got into like animation, how you got to working with Disney and, you know, furthermore, how you got to like the level that you are in terms of in the animation industry. Well, um, mine is a long and storied career. <laughs> um, actually, you know, when I was a little girl, I wanted to be a singer. I wanted to okay. be a singer. And um, it eventually turned into wanting to be a puppeteer and a ventriloquist and lots of performing things. And my mother, who I love, 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 mm -hmm. uh, but she's no longer with me, she was not thrilled with those career choices because okay. she was concerned that I was going to starve. You know, makes sense. So, um, her diabolical plan was to actually push me in that direction and, you know, along with my stepmom, you know, get me in dance class and then piano and, you know, all of these things, hoping that I'd burn out. Mm. Um, but it was, it backfired. And so not only did I, you know, oh, I'm a horrible dancer. Okay, and I didn't, you know, I, I can't play the piano. Yeah, I can, I can play the radio and that's it. I still sing. But it made me want to go to Broadway. It made me want to be a Broadway performer. Um, and uh, so I went to California Institute of the Arts, which is a uh, school in Santa Clarita that is, that has an animation department, but I went there for theater. Okay. And um, I had gone to high school when I had been in high school that had a huge performing arts department, you know, think Glee. Um, it was that kind of thing before Glee was a thing. And um, so going to Cal Arts was a big culture shock for me because they were more the sort of dark, brooding, you know, theater stuff. And I'm like, I just want to go to Broadway and sing and dance, you know? And they were like, yeah, no, we don't do that here. And by the end of my first year there, um, a lot of things conspired so that I ended up becoming a Christian. And I looked at my current trajectory in theater and I thought I was gonna to have to compromise too much of what I believed as a Christian. So um, I had friends who were in animation and I would go visit them all the time. And, and, and up until I made this decision, you know, at one point I was visiting one gentleman there and um, he asked me what I had done that day. And I talked about, you know, whatever deep angsty thing I had done in, in theater, uh, theater class. And um, I asked what he had done. And he said, well, I, uh, we had uh, Chuck Jones come to our talk to us today. I went, oh, Chuck Jones? You had Chuck Jones? Oh, my gosh. And he's like, do you know who Chuck Jones is? I said, yeah. He did the Grinch and the Tom and Jerry with the Grinch eyes. That, and, the, and he's like, get out of theater. There's no reason why you should know that. <laughs> you know? And I was like, oh, stop it. Well, then I became a Christian and then I you know, looked at my life and I was like, you know what, I'm gonna, I'm gonna check out the animation department. 
Okay. So um, I went to the to the to the dean of animation, and um, I wrote him a big long letter, and let him know that God wanted me in animation. And he read it, and he got back to me, and he said, "But you can't draw." And I said, "Well, God wants me in animation." So um, he told me to go out and, and do some drawings and come back. So I, I was working at Magic Mountain as an airbrush t-shirt artist. And okay. so on my break time, I would just draw the people that I would see and I'd bring it back and he'd go, okay, do some more. So then I came back the next week and he's like, do some more. And so after three weeks, he told this one guy, he says, you know, Carol still can't draw, but I'm going to let her in on her enthusiasm. So that's when I translate transferred over into animation and sort of stuck with that for the next three years and graduated on that. And, and, um, at the end of my time there, um, the Dean called me into the school and I mean, called me into his office and he said, you know, when you first got here, um, you couldn't draw, but now you're a wonderful draftswoman, but you'll never work at Disney because you're black and a woman. Mm. And that was my first job was out of school, was actually, I had a job while I was in school working for Marvel, not the Marvel, it's still the same thing, but not the Marvel that it became, right. but I didn't know Marvel Studios, so like Muppet Babies and that kind of stuff. But when I graduated from school, my first job was working for Disney um, on Oliver and Company. Okay. And so it just kind of, it just kind of sort of went from there. I just kind of, my career just kind of bounced around from there, but that's how I got into animation. It was quite not by my choice. You know, I always liked drawing as a child, but, you know, they say a vocation is a calling. And I believe that, you know, animation is my, the animation industry is my vocation. So. Yeah, I would say, yeah, that's very inspiring, I guess, to hear that where, from where you started, even though it was like in the arts as well, that through religion is what kind of led you to animation because mm -hmm. when I see other people I don't know if I necessarily hear that a lot um, uh -huh. when it comes to like how people got an animation usually it's a lot of them just got inspired by like cartoons and one thing led to them going to Cal Arts or to uh, one of the, some of the other art schools so that's very interesting but also pretty cool I might because I'm also a Christian too Nice. personally like I believe that my calling for one is to help people through like creating um, <laughs> and specifically I'm studying engineering but, oh, wow, wow. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. but also like I have talents in the arts as well I mean as you can see like yeah this yeah. is one of the many things that I can do but yeah but, yeah yeah, and I just want to interject, you know, I have like a huge recent, in the, within the last year, um, respect for engineers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because, you know, I was, I'm developing, I'm trying to develop a little kid's show about a girl who is an engineer. But when I was trying to find, sorry, that'll make me tear up. When I was trying to find a hook for it, you know, a friend of mine, um, who's an engineer says, well, we just want to solve problems, you know, and it's, you know, I, I always just thought of up until that point, engineers as just these sort of brainiacs with, you know, mm -hmm. rollers, you right. know, but to see the world around me, you know, the, um, as engineered for want of a better word, I can't, I'm using the word, mm -hmm in in the description engineered to make our lives easier right. you know somebody sorry somebody came up with that so you have a wonderful job you have a wonderful thing so keep doing that sorry sorry thank you, <laughs> thank you so much i'm okay <laughs> <laughs> um but that also leads me to like my next question um what like animators specifically like inspired you um, when you got into the industry? Like, and it doesn't have to be D Disney animators, but okay. you know, in, gen um, in general, um, well, blues was one of them. Okay. Um, you know, I, I loved the secret of Nim. <laughs> um, 
And uh, also, you know, of course, the nine old men, you know, when I was a child, first movie I saw was um, Hunter One Dalmatians, one of the first movies I saw. Okay. It was on a double bill with Snoopy Come Home. But, <laughs> but for some reason, you know, the, those dogs stuck with me more than Snoopy. Um, just the way they were drawn and the way they acted. And, you know, I wanted a Dalmatian for the longest time until I got old enough to see a Dalmatian. And I'm like, they do not look like the drawings. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, so, you know, going back that far, I mean, I loved Roger, the animation of Roger coming down the stairs singing Cruella de Vil, you know, and it's just like, he moves like a real person, you know, so that, those early, as a child, those things sort of imprinted on me, even though I didn't necessarily know animation was a job. Yes, I did draw in the corners of my pages of my books mm -hmm. um, and, and flipped it, but it was just more the fascination of watching that movement, not like it was something I wanted to do. But those things stuck with me so that once I got into animation, I wanted to do things with human beings or wanted to tell, um, it was originally animation before I got into story, but okay. I just loved the, the concept of being able to make a drawing move like a human, you know, in, a, in an exaggerated way. Not like super rotoscope, but like, um, right. yeah. Okay. Yeah, animation, um, like for me, like a lot of the guys that I saw, um, and I know of a lot because mm -hmm. I'm a cartoon aficionado uh, uh -huh. but like bluth is a person I've, I've checked out his work he's definitely mm -hmm. inspiring but i, I also want to say like another name for me at least uh, is the craig mccracken uh i think what did he animate uh craig mc is he not an animator Am i don't I know i don't know i don't know everybody's name so i'm you know i know i shouldn't say that okay but, yeah yeah. Um, I will okay. say. Yeah. What has he done? Hmm? What has he done? What has he done? Uh, the most notable work uh, for me was uh, Foster's Home for Imaginary Friends. Oh, okay. He okay. made that a cartoon. Mm -hmm. um, and then also Gindy Tartakovsky with Samurai Jack. Okay. Is, yeah, yeah. Is another one. Uh, I'm forgetting his name, but he's a very popular Disney animator. I think his name is James Baxter. Yes. Yeah, I know James. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Beautiful work. Yeah. So I, I would say like those three are probably in my in the top five as far as like what got me interested in wanting to learn more about it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Well, like I said, I I can definitely sit here and talk about all the intricacies of animation because I I find it very very interesting. Uh huh. So, but yeah. I'm going to move on to the next question, mm -hmm. which is. What was the process for getting into Cal Arts? If you could mm -hmm. describe that. Um, well, for me, like I, I talked about a little bit earlier, it was different than like a lot of people where they, they generate portfolios. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's been so, it's been so long. Um, I think I think I might have brought like some drawings that I had. I had like I wanted to be Charles Schultz as a kid mm -hmm. um in addition to wanting you know moving into acting you know i was just like i drew i had my little characters and i i i uh copy copy got them copy written and um i you know tried to get syndicated you know as a kid and um so i had these characters that i drew all the time and so that is what i showed the dean of the school and he said that i couldn't draw um Wow. And so, you know, from there, it was my really, I mean, if you look at my stuff back then, it was, I'm not talking about my, my cartoons. I'm talking about what I did to get into the school where I just like, I drew basically like round heads and, and more or less, they were bad, <laughs> they were bad. But like I said, you know, God opened the door. You know, there's a verse that says the king's heart is like water in the streams of the king's heart is like water in the hands of the Lord and he turns it in whichever direction he pleases, you mm -hmm. know? 
So in the end, you know, my bad drawings, um, God into this guy's heart to, to let me in. Um, you know, it's like I said, most people have to turn in portfolios and, right. and have them be really super on point to get in, especially now because it's such a competitive field. Definitely. Um, yeah. Mm. Would you say, so I'm, I'm assuming like back then it wasn't as competitive, I guess. It, to was, do. it was competitive. I just, you know, sort of, just sort of slid in. <laughs> Oh, yeah. there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, hey, you got to get your foot in the door somehow. Yeah. I'm not mad at that. So. <laughs> yeah, my, um, my classmates, the people I graduated with were Tony Facilli, who um, designed and looks like Bob Parr. <laughs> um, Greg Vanzo, who owns Rough Draft Studios. Okay. Um, Clay Hall, who was running, was like, you know, mostly running Disney tunes for a while. Um, Doug Frankel, who's up at Pixar. I mean, so lots of big, big people were in my class. So it's not like I was I was in with a bunch of people who were like, hey, I like to draw stick figures. You know, so um so the my class my class was no slouch. Was no slouch. I mean the class beneath me had Rich Moore, who is yep. directed, you know, Zootopia and James Reardon um Russ Edmonds big big people so it was a it was still a it was it was a thing even then a force even then okay yeah Rob Minkoff direct, uh graduated the year before me so oh yeah yeah so those those are all like definitely big names though including your own though I like yeah um, you're up yeah. there too <laughs> But, you know, that should be an encouragement to people. It's like, um, it's a little different now. You know, sometimes, you know, kids will, you know, contact me and they'll say, my school won't let me in because they say that I'm not good. And I'll look at their stuff and I'll be like, not really. But I don't say that to them. Mm -hmm. You know, I say, if the school's not going to let you in, there are plenty of other places. There are plenty of other things to do. I mean, you can just keep drawing. And keep putting your stuff out there. Doesn't mean just because they tell you no. If you really think that this is something you should be doing, there's plenty, especially now with the internet, there yep. are plenty of avenues of getting yourself out there and continuing to, to build on your craft. So, um, and who knows, you might set up the next style by just putting yourself out there and having good ideas. Very, very true. Okay, so my next question um, is dealing with equity and inclusion. Specifically, um, have you ever dealt with an equity and inclusion issue in your industry? And how did you come up with a compromise if things didn't turn out the way that you'd hoped? Um, that's an interesting question. Um, I the the industry has changed over the years mm -hmm. um, in terms of, you know, the projects I worked on, everybody was pretty much white. So, <laughs> yeah. you know, it wasn't like, you know, I worked on Tarzan, you know, and um, I uh, worked on Little Mermaid, you know, Sebastian was black, but, you know, I was so early. I mean, I was so, I was in such a, I was, uh, especially on Little Mermaid, I was in a place where I wasn't designing, you know, I was a, I was a training animator, you know, so especially in those early, early years, um, you know, I, I was not in a position that I had any kind of voice. Um, but as time sort of went on, and I went to, um, I became a character designer. Um, it once again, the shows you know, to have shows being, to, to have shows with inclusive characters, you have to have a, 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 a world that can support it. And at the time they weren't thinking about worlds that were multi-ethnic. Um, does that make sense? It does. I'm a little bit surprised, but I, I, I understand. Well, no, I mean, look at the shows that they were doing. Um, Goofy movie, I'm sorry, Goof Troop, mm -hmm. um, Darkwing Duck. Yep. Um, uh, uh, Marsupilami, 
um, you know, I'm thinking like the 90s shows. Right. Um, and, you know, even the features I worked on, like Rover Dangerfield. I mean, that was Rodney Dangerfield. Yep. You know, and so that's, you know, people, people tend to, I don't, I, I know there's the whole concept of institutionalized racism. And then there's, you know, people who are just, you flat out racist. But I think a lot of the, a lot of the times people are just, they just do what they know. You yeah. know, um, I have, I have a friend who is a feature film director, a live action feature film director. And um, we had, we had gone to high school together and he's now a live action feature film director, okay. but he was doing his first uh, feature film. And um, he asked me, um, he, he basically, he said, it didn't occur to him. We got, a, we got in the conversation of race because he asked me a question that, that ended up being, that ended up being answered the question. And he said, it doesn't, it didn't occur to him unless it's written in the script to include any person of color. Wow. Um, it's... Just, just it, but, and it's not, it, he's not a racist guy. He's actually a really wonderful person. Oh it just, yeah. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not doubting that. Yeah. It's but. just, because his world, his world mm -hmm. was very white world. And so, but after that conversation, if you look at his movies, there was always a black person in his films. And um, so it, that conversation helped him at least like, oh, this is something I need to think about, you know, because the world is not just me. Right. You know? Everybody, everybody on this planet is self-centered everybody you know so you're going to do what you look at in the mirror you know you're going to do who you hang out with and it doesn't necessarily make people um bad for doing that they just it just doesn't cross their minds <laughs> you know so um so more recently you know, I'm seeing younger people, you know, I, I'm working, uh, I worked on um, a, um, a show um, at a studio that, mm -hmm. you know, one of the characters was African American, just kind of just built in, baked into the show. Okay. Um, and my job was to do storybooks on the show, which is a focus testing job. It's not like storybooks that will ever be in a, in a store. It's just like focus okay. testing. They write the script, they do, or before they write the script, they write a story, a storybook, and then it gets illustrated. And then they take that storybook to a school and they read the story to the kids to see if they comprehend the story and whatever questions the kids or the areas they get hung up on, they go back and they fix it in the script. Okay. So it's just testing to make sure the script, the story works before they go into right, the script. Right. Excuse me. Um, because the African American character was one of three. And the main character, I mean, they're all mains, but the main character is white. Mm -hmm. It didn't cross my mind to put any people of color in it. I just always just drew everything that was in that world because based on a comic book and that comic book was always white. So I just always did okay. that. One day I walked past this one girl who is also a storybook artist, really sweet young lady, um, white from... Bad, like I, even in the south and I looked down and she had drawn a little black girl on her thing and I was like oh, I can do that I can add African Americans to this and this white girl had done it you know um, and she's young so I think younger people have a tendency to be like you know what the world is more than just me yeah um, I would definitely say that that's very true I mean like for me um, when and if no actually no if when i get around to doing it though like um my story or whatever like it's i plan to make it very multicultural only because you know i think i've seen every a lot of different types of people um different skin colors i've mm -hmm. been out of the country a couple of times mm -hmm. and i've just seen like a lot of people though so i don't think in to me though i don't it'd be very difficult for me not to have like a multicultural cast right, right, yeah. of uh, of characters, and I I do I'm starting to see more of that um, with cartoons now. I mean, you have cartoons like uh, Gravity Falls, the the Owl House. Um, there's also this isn't as new, but the Boondocks is another one. That's, yeah. Um, 
where there's definitely start to there's more emphasis put on other ethnic characters to mm. represent their stories and that's what i've me growing up as as a kid kind of yeah. more of it's just you know because most people in the industry to my understanding were not black um we didn't really see our yeah. side of the story yeah. at all really <laughs> so yeah. Yeah, and it's not, I mean, like, like I said, it's not, it's not an intentional slight. It's just, you just do what you know. And, you know, when I went to France um, to work on the Goofy movie, doing um, animation, you know, my boss spoke about as much English as I spoke French. And, you know, for the first three weeks, we just kind of like went, you know and smiled at each other um but it was like okay i need to i need to get my scenes approved so i'm gonna have to like work up the courage to you know use my bad french and you know speak with him mm -hmm. and so um you know like the last time i saw him at work this is three weeks in the last time i saw him at work he you know came over and he sat down and he haltingly you know spoke to me in english and i poorly spoke to him in French as we went over my scene mm -hmm. and the next day he was not there I'm like where's Stefan and they said oh he was in a horrible motorcycle accident he's in the hospital now and I went to the hospital that weekend to go see him and he was all in casts and he was all you know trussed up and everything and, and um, thankfully he survived and he's well he was one of the key animators on Tarzan and, um, but at one point, you know, we sat there and visited for a while. And I I just, I sat there kind of like drifting in and out of the conversation because I didn't speak the language. Right. You know? um, and there were other French people there talking to him. So after about an hour, hour and a half, um, his mother came in. Okay. And she this was the first time she saw him and she just started weeping and so we were like oh you know but i thought to myself if people understood that there were people in other parts of the world who had moms that cared about them they would be more understanding and compassionate of other people you know and so that was like a that was a big eye-opening moment for me because you know my world is very closed Mm -hmm. you know until i went to another another place and saw somebody hurt and mourning so um it is we live in very closed worlds and especially even more closed now because you know we're in a pandemic so we're just right. even more isolated and social media does not help us and so um yeah we just need to remember that the, there are other people who have other points of view you know, on both sides and take time and be patient with everyone. Okay. That was a really good answer too. <laughs> Thank you for that. Yeah. Um, so my next question is what inspired you to write uh, your first book? Uh, the weight one or the, the children's book? The, uh, the fish out of water. Fish out of water. Okay. Um, Cause that was actually my second book. Oh, that was uh, that, oh, my bad. Yeah. Oh, no, it's okay. It's okay. Um, Fish Out of Water was actually, you know, kind of ties back into that, to that question, the, the previous question, in that um, I saw Harry Met Sally when Harry Met Sally and fell in love with big band music. My father had all these old jazz records that I was all like, Ugh. <laughs> you know i was like i don't want to listen to any of this louis armstrong Louis armstrong i don't care about any of this but harry connick jr sings it and i'm all like oh wow this stuff is really pretty awesome mm -hmm. so initially what i wanted to do is i wanted to do a story um about a guy set in the 1940s who was a, a kind of a surly pianist who um got stuck with a girl to be in a be in a competition you know a girl singer this sort of timid girl singer and so she was black he was white 
my big deal on that story was that she, I mean, for me, the design is not only was she black, but she also had to be somewhat zoftic, you know, because I was tired of these little waif girls. And so it was, it was like, well, it was foregone conclusion. She's going to be black because, you know, mm -hmm. I was going to play the voice, but she also had to have a little weight on her. You know, that was my big thing. Mm -hmm. um, but then I thought about it and I was like, well, I'm a woman. Why am I writing a story with the male as the lead? should probably make the female as the lead and then i thought about it so this is like this is going over time this is not like I, these thoughts came to me initially um then i thought about it and i'm like well then that makes him the white guy helping her and i don't want to do that story and this is before i realized that was a thing you know <laughs> so i'm like well i should make him black and then i thought about it and i was like oh wait a second you know, Walt Disney said, why do something in live act animation that you can do in live action? So I'm like, I need to make him magical. Actually, he was a white magical guy. That was, so it was the magical thing that happened first. Right. And then he became black. Um, and then because he's magical, I was like, why don't I just make him purple? Because he's magical. He doesn't have to be a color, but he does have African-American features. And then I was like, why don't I just make everybody black? You know, so yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then she ended up actually losing weight. So it was just like, cause I lost weight. So I was like, I don't care that, you know, that, that, that conviction went away. But, um, but it was actually challenging, you know, when I was trying to pitch the idea around town, cause it was an actual feature initially, a feature idea. And um, people were saying, this is a really charming idea, but mm, it's black. Because this is 1989, you know, yeah. and uh, this was before um, Tyler Perry, you know, before Princess and the Frog, and um, you know, people were still saying that black black stuff didn't sell. Which is, I just, mm, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> that, that, yes, that is that is something to be annoyed at, but that yeah. was what Hollywood was, and that's you know. So, um, so I just kind of went, okay. So after, you know, 20 years of trying to push that rock up and over the hill, I just kind of like went, okay, I'm just going to put it away. So, you know, fast forward to, um, about two years ago, I was like, I'm out of a job again. So I need to, uh, work on my portfolio. So I've pulled out some of the drawings that I had started. And so I, you know, I'm like, I'm going to, at the time when I had done them, they were done on cells. So I'm just gonna scan in some of my rough drawings, clean it up and paint it on the computer. And I'm like, wait a minute, I like these drawings. You know, why don't I just, see? as I spent the last five years on Sophia the First, Elena of Avalor and Fancy Nancy doing storybooks, mm -hmm. now that I have that skill, why don't I write my own children's storybook and teach myself how to paint, because I didn't know how to paint at the time. Teach myself how to paint and just write a children's book. Um, and then who knows if anything will happen to it from there. So um, I did that and then self-published it because I had already done the other book, if we did the problem and knew how to do it. And um, so that is where the story came from. And now it's like, I love the story. It has to be a movie. I must find out a way to make it a movie. You know, so we'll, we're working on that, so. Yeah. Oh, okay. That's definitely cool to hear because like I'm a like another film. You mentioned like a Princess and the Frog. Yeah. Like I, that is one of my favorites just because I was like, I it's just amazing that this even exists. Like the Princess oh, and the Frog yeah. and yeah. Uh, the fact. And I've seen I haven't read your book, but I've seen like pictures from it on like your website. And I said I kind of want to return to this world again, but even potentially have a story even more focused on the African-American experience um, in, in this like jazz setting. Mm -hmm. So, and it's like, you know, and it's not even like for me, it's not even like an African-American experience in that it's just a person. It's just a person who happens to be black. And, and yeah, I do do things like the club owners are white because in the forties they were, right. um, but it's just, you know, she works, when I was in France, you know, what inspired where she is, because she works as a fish shop, works in a fish shop, 
I used to walk past this market every day and there was a woman who stood out in the front in like a kiosk um, and she sold fish, but she was dressed to the nines. You know, she did this horrible, horrible job and she found some dignity in the process of doing it. And she was African. Mm -hmm. you know so her hair was slicked back and she's these giant hoop earrings but she was covered in blood you know and she just did these this fish stuff and I just I said I want to tell a story about that person you know except sort of put me in the midst of it which is like somebody who's like okay I'm gonna work really hard but okay this is not where I belong you know I, right. I house sat for somebody and and I was there for a month while they were in, in Europe and I broke something every week, you know, because it was just like, not intentionally, it was just like, I just felt so uncomfortable in that world, oh, okay. you know? So I wanted somebody who was working really hard, but uncomfortable in that world and, and destined for a world that was someplace else. And so that's the story I wanted to tell. And she just happens to be black because I'm black, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, now, this is a question like I'm pretty sure a lot of people want to hear your answer to that don't know, but how did you get involved with the Goofy movie? Because I know like I asked you this like a while back though, and you told me, but like for those who don't know, because I'm pretty sure like when a lot of people saw that you made Roxanne, that was probably like a shocker to mm -hmm. to uh not only to me but i was like wow i didn't even know like that there was like a um an, like a minority animator creator that made one of these like iconic characters because roxanne i mean granted max is also up there in terms right, of right, right, yeah. my ranking but like roxanne was one of those characters that i just kind of wanted to see like a lot more of even like past all the goofy stuff so how did you get into the position where you were like designing a character for what is one of the best animated films of the 90s? Oh, um, Kevin Lima. Kevin Lima, thanks you. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I was, I was working on um, the Little Mermaid TV show as a character designer. And um, I had had this, this wonderful boss who really encouraged and pushed me to be um, a better artist um, or encouraged me so that I became a better artist. He didn't push me to be a better artist. I was an artist already. He hired me, but he hired me actually as a, as a, somebody to clean up character designs. But then he saw that I could actually do them. And so he moved me into doing character designs. But he also pushed me because I just... I just drew what came out of my head and off of my arm and I didn't physically feel the characters when I designed them. So my drawings got like really way better working for him. Well, one day I had some drawings that I had left on my table and I went to lunch. Mm -hmm. and, and when I came back, Kevin, who I had gone to college with, apparently had been snooping around my office. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and he asked me if I would um, design a character for him. He said, the thing is, is that um, we, I haven't asked anybody's permission to ask somebody else to design his character. So would you just do this for free? Would you do it on your lunchtime? And I was like, sure. So um, I just did Roxanne. Um, and you know, I put a mole on her cheek cause I have a mole on my cheek. I don't know which side it is, but cause I'm always looking at it in the mirror. I put a mole there. I did, the hair is Ariel's hair basically because I was working on the little mermaid. Um, she's really simple. I mean, if you look at her, she's just a dog faced girl that has Ariel hair, but I was, I was, um, also working with high school kids in my church. And so I imbued a lot of, you know, I mean the, I think the charm of Roxanne is the kids that I knew. Um, and, you know, it's the same with <clears throat> all the other incidental kid characters that were on the show. Chad was a character that nobody knows anymore, but he has one scene where he's kissing a blonde girl in, yep. in After Today. Yep. He had a bigger, he had a bigger role, but all these kids were all based off of kids that I knew. 
you know and so um but that's how how me and roxanne happened on the show and so he so kevin took this and went to the person in charge and he said you know i want carol on the show and they were like but but and they and he's like no this is the person i want and so i ended up going on the show and um, doing character design and then eventually moving into um doing storyboard revisions and story at the time i liked telling story mm -hmm. but never occurred to me to be a storyboard artist i did some story gags for Marsupilami little little mm -hmm. twenty five second bumpers that they had on the Disney Junior. I don't think it was Disney Junior at the time. Disney Afternoon. Oh yeah. yeah. Um, but you know, uh, Glenn Keane's wife had said to me, "Well, maybe God wants you in story." And I'm like, "Well, I don't want to do that." You know. So here I am. You know, a year later. And God's like, yeah, I'm not doing story, you know. So I'm doing storyboard revisions um, on a Goofy movie, and then a little bit of story, and then I went to France and did, you know, some animation, and then I came back, and they said, you have no job, <laughs> and I said, okay, I'm gonna go off and I'm gonna go do my film now. And, and Kevin contacted them and said, why are you letting my people go? You know, you want me to do Tarzan? Tarzan was gonna be a Disney TV not disney feature oh, Since wow. you're letting, yeah you're letting my people go and they went you have a job and i was like okay and um so when they took disney when they took tarzan from disney tv and put it at disney features it was like yay i get to go to features you know <laughs> so yeah you get two answers for one yeah that's that's interesting it seems like there was a lot of wishy-washy kind of stuff going on where you like you didn't know if you're gonna have a job though and then you mm -hmm. just oh now you have one and then yeah. oh you're out of a job and oh there's something over here that we want you to do so now you're hired again <laughs> so yeah 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 it's it you know and it's and it's a, you know for the, the the kids who are who might stumble upon this you know that's kind of what animation is you know i mean there are some people who have a very direct path you know this is what i did and this is how i got there but you know for many of us it's the people that you know and you're friends with and um you just kind of go from place to place it's it's like the circus as a you know the circus is a very gypsy kind of lifestyle um and animation is very much the same way thank you for your answer uh and it does seem like we're almost out of time so i'm going to ask you one last question before i end this out and that question is, um, where would you like to see the future of the animation industry go? And where do you see uh, you in it? The future of the animation industry, I think animation is doing great. Um, I, it's a good question. I have not given that much thought in terms of where do I see the future animate, where I'd like to see the future animation go. Um, you know, I love what's happening now, you know, there's, there's, there's such a, a broad variation of things now, which is interesting, you know, before there was only Disney um, mm -hmm. stuff, um, or Pixar, which is just basically Disney without the kissing. Um, right. You know, <laughs> DreamWorks, same, same thing, you know, the giant world saved by geek, you know, so <laughs> it's like they're all, there's just like those three worlds. But then you have like, I lost my body, which is just an amazing film. You know, it's a little gritty for me, but at the end I was, I was, I think, you, you, you know which one I'm talking about, the hand. I don't think I've seen that one. You need to see that film. It's amazing. I guess I, gotta, I guess I'm gonna have to watch it now. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. I was just blown away. I was like, "This is filmmaking," you know. The animation isn't that awesome. Um, it's well, I shouldn't say that. The animation is great for what it is. It's just not what I'm used to in terms of Disney stuff. But it's just amazing filmmaking. Um, so you know, they're starting to you know, there's the Secret of the Cows. There's you know, just like all these just various different worlds that are 
that are saying that animation is more than just for kids. You know, me personally, I like films that, that kids can see, but also not talk down to kids. Um, That's so, good. yeah. Um, so, I mean, yes, there is a place for Mickey Mouse Clubhouse. Um, and I'm glad to be able to work on those things as well. Um, but you know me, I, I want to keep doing. I want to. I want to have more opportunities to do features. I would. I would love to direct, you know, or or at least just keep you know being able to tell story. So that is where I see myself, um, and that's you know my thoughts on the animation industry. All right. Well, thank you for that response, and just thank you uh, for taking the time just to answer my questions and continuing to inspire and to educate uh, those who are interested in doing what you do currently. Um, I'm pretty sure all of them as well as me are looking forward to seeing what you do in the future with your own show potentially in the works and uh, we definitely can't wait to see what fruits bear from that. Thanks. Thank you for having me on your show and you asked some very good questions. Thank you. Now, uh, for those out there who are looking to learn more about what Carol Holliday has spoken about on here and what she plans to do, I'm going to post all of her website links and her social media in the description below. So you can go and check those out. And if you want to support me, you can subscribe and like this video. And you can also go and follow Greg Talks on Instagram uh, and wherever you listen to your podcast. Uh, but with that, um, I hope you all have a great day and I will see you later. Bye. Bye.